you very much uh, for, the, for the invitation uh, to come and speak to you. Um, a wonderful letter from, from Tom, um, making clear that um, some of your speakers in the past include Mikhail Gorbachev, <laughs> Gordon Brown, Ban Ki-moon, Christine Lagarde. I am fascinated to understand who you are confusing me for. <laughs> <laughs> because I am certainly not in that league. But I do appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to come and say a few words. Um, just by way of a sort of preface, uh, coming to Dublin uh, is always uh, a pleasure uh, for me. One of my earliest memories of coming to Dublin was in the early 70s, uh, going to Santry Stadium for the Irish Schools Athletics Championships. I, I know it uh, takes a bit of imagination these days, but, but back then... Uh, successful enough uh, to represent Ireland uh, at that year's uh, international event, uh, which was in Scotland. And although I'm a unionist leader, very proud uh, of my Irishness, and I think it feeds into that old John Hewitt sense of I'm an Ulsterman, I'm Irish, British and European, uh, and, and if you deny any part of that, you diminish who I am. And indeed, proud Irishman uh, like Edward Carson uh, from, from, from Dublin. Uh, and a more recent visit uh, to Dublin was earlier this year when we went to the Royal Irish Academy uh, as the Ulster Unionist Party uh, to bring on an event as part of our contribution to the centenary uh, of Easter uh, 1916. And I stand to be corrected because we, we only thought of it as we were actually setting up our, our stall on the day, but somebody said, are we the first Unionists to actually put on an event in Dublin since the 1920s. Uh, and nobody has been able to say, you're not, uh, which is quite shocking uh, to me, but also reflects uh, something else that I feel about unionism. Uh, and it, it was very well summarized in a conversation I had in Belfast some years ago uh, with a former American ambassador to Dublin. Uh, and when we established that I was not a career politician and that he was not a career diplomat, uh, we decided we would engage in some plain speaking. And his home truth to me was the problem with unionism is that your PR is crap. <laughs> and, and I have to say it's very hard to disagree because I think if you look back over the years, unionism has not been good uh, at engaging and explaining uh, its position. And if you don't explain your position, you can't expect somebody else to do it for you. Uh, and there's little point, for example, uh, over the decades in accusing various uh, American administrations of being green when you've never given them the unionist perspective uh, as, as the counterpoint. So on that basis, I'm very uh, pleased to accept the invitation uh, to be here today. Uh, Tom cleverly pinned me down uh, to a title uh, and an abstract. Uh, and shamelessly, I chose for my title uh, the title of our initial document uh, on, on Brexit. You're, you're probably aware that the First and Deputy First Ministers wrote a letter to Prime Minister May uh, on the 10th of August uh, about Brexit. <coughs> it identified five areas uh, of concern, uh, and I've no difficulty with, with those areas. They are they're valid areas of concern. They were the border, trade and access to, to labour energy, uh, EU funding, uh, and, and agri-food. The difficulty I have was, that was the 10th of August, but those issues were as plain on the 5th of April or May or June as they were uh, in August. And they did not go on to offer any solutions, any pathways, uh, or any vision. So what we have tried to do in this document is provide a kind of framework made up of three things. A vision for how Northern Ireland might prosper or benefit in a post-Brexit era. The kind of strategy that we need to put in place yesterday uh, to make sure that we benefit out of the negotiations. And then what we call 10 key asks, in other words, 10 developments or action points which could be used to measure how successful we have been at the end of those negotiations. So in terms of, of the vision, we, we looked at the border 
And the whole conversation seems to be negative at the moment and about whether we need gatekeepers, uh, and if so, how many and in what way, rather than focusing on the fact that there is a gate uh, and how we keep that gate open to best effect. Uh, it is to become a border between the United Kingdom and the European Union post-Brexit. And that means, to my mind, Northern Ireland has the opportunity to become the UK's gateway to the European Union. Now, I can't tell you in huge detail how that works, because we have to know whether we're doing it in the context of access to the single market, whether we're in the customs union, or what vision the Prime Minister has for the whole of the United Kingdom uh, beyond uh, Brexit. The second thing was, was the strategy, and, and here I am astonished to discover that there has been practically no contingency planning uh, by the Northern Ireland Executive. Now, I have to say, when I thought about the civil service, I thought it, it could not be that somebody like Sir Malcolm McKibben would not have done something. And as we were to discover a few weeks ago under a Freedom of Information request, he had asked the various departments to contingency plan ahead of the 23rd of June. Uh, but the document was never completed, and the First Minister claims she never saw it. Uh, we subsequently heard that the Department of Agriculture had given lines to people manning their telephone helpline to be used on the 24th of June, but all the lines that were given out to be used in response to queries were predicated on a Remain vote. And it was only early on the 24th that somebody started feeding lines that reflected the fact that the UK had voted to come out. So there was very, very little contingency planning. We need to move on from that. And what I believe the executive needs to do now is in the first instance put together the intellectual capacity and resource to look at the policy <coughs> options, define what our preferences and priorities are, and then critically try and assess whether those priorities complement the UK's or clash with them. Uh, and it seems to me inevitably there will be clashes in priorities, and where there are, those will be very serious. For example, agriculture is a much more important sector to the Northern Ireland economy than agriculture is uh, deemed to be by the London government. So Mrs May and her team made aside in the fullness of time, it's a really good idea to do some sort of trade deal for South American beef. Now, as I understand it, South America can produce quality beef. They can do it with uh, welfare guarantees of a reasonable standard to satisfy most people uh, in the United Kingdom. And they can do it at about 40% less cost than people are paying at the moment. So on that basis, Mrs May may decide that's a really good deal, but it could wipe out our beef sector, and not just Northern Ireland. It could do tremendous damage to yours, and we've already seen what's happened to mushroom farmers uh, here in the Republic of Ireland. So knowing when the priorities clash is absolutely critical, but we haven't even identified the priorities in, in any great detail uh, at the moment. And the intellectual capacity exists, but it's not in the right place. It's not up the hill at Stormont Castle, or indeed in Parliament buildings. It's in gatherings like this, on both sides of the border. And I have a fear that the two big parties of the executive in Northern Ireland uh, instinctively like to hold power very, very close, uh, and will not consult in an open way uh, as I would like to say to other people, you probably know things that we don't. So you tell us, and we will use that knowledge uh, to inform our strategy uh, going forward on these issues. About three weeks ago, uh, David Sterling, the Permanent Secretary of the Department of Finance, stood in for Malcolm McKibben in coming to the Committee of the Executive Office to talk about what was happening behind the scenes. And as part of his evidence, he said, when, uh, Chancellor, uh, when the Chancellor announced initially that any application for EU funding that was signed off by the Autumn Statement was, was guaranteed, 
they had done a risk assessment and determined that around mm. 1 billion euro of Northern Ireland applications for EU funding uh, were at risk. And then when Philip Hammond went to his Conservative Party conference and said, I tell you what, we're going to be a bit more generous, the risk dropped from a billion euro to under 100 million euro, more than a 90% swing in one sentence of one speech. Now, my concern is that we are not monitoring in a live sense these developments because the next sentence in the next speech may be equally dramatic but it may be the opposite of what Mr Hammond did. It could be as bad as that was good for us. Are we able to monitor that in live time and then do we have the communication channels to say to the right people, hey, that's disastrous <clears throat> for us. And that's not just a matter of having a communications channel from Belfast to London. We also need a communication <coughs> channel from Belfast to Dublin. Because of the remaining EU members, nobody is in any doubt that Ireland will be our best friends and potentially our biggest advocates, and they'll be on the other side of the negotiating table. So it is absolutely critical, I think, that our executive uh, engages. And you may be looking at me and saying, yeah, but you didn't bother coming down two days ago for the, for the big conversation. Well, there were reasons for that, and I would just assure you that yesterday uh, I sat with a delegation of Ulster Unionists and greeted and Taoiseach and Charlie Flanagan, uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs. We had a very good initial discussion. Uh, I'm not sure they were entirely aware uh, that we'd already committed initial thoughts uh, in some detail uh, in this document, uh, but they took it away and we will uh, continue that di dialogue in the coming weeks and months because we, we recognise the mutual interest in trying to identify the threats, to mitigate them, and trying to find and then maximise any opportunities uh, that exist. In terms of the third thing, that the, the 10 asks, you know, if, if there is all this money, these billions of sterling being repatriated, then I think Northern Ireland needs to use this moment as an opportunity to say, we have changed our political thinking. Uh, we are no longer coming to you with a begging bowl because we've run out of cash for welfare or for this or for that. But actually we're taking a longer term strategic view of how do we make Northern Ireland a much more attractive proposition for investors, indigenous and foreign direct, because we want to be less dependent. Some politicians in Northern Ireland seem to be very comfortable with the fact that we're dependent to the tune of about 10 billion sterling per annum. I am not. I would like us to aspire to be where we were 100 years ago, uh, when that corner of Ireland was basically a net contributor to the Treasury. We won't get back there because we've got a health service and we've got state pensions, but the aspiration, the effort, would be transformational in our society. So rather than take a begging bowl approach, because we've got short-term monetary cash flow problems, what I would like us to do is to pitch for two things out of the 10 particularly, uh, which would transform us as an economy. One is infrastructure, and the other is a step change in skills. If you look at our infrastructure, it's not good. Uh, you used European money for infrastructure, we tended not to. Uh, and within infrastructure, as well as the roads and all the rest, uh, our biggest concern is energy. Uh, not just the cost, and we are, I think, the second highest for energy costs in Western Europe, but supply, the security of supply, uh, is in great danger. To the point where it is not sensational to say that some residents of Northern Ireland could celebrate our centenary in 2021 by candlelight. We are getting to the stage where there is an existential threat to the supply across the whole of Northern Ireland. So infrastructure is critical. And skills also. Just yesterday, I was talking to the son of one of our most successful entrepreneurs who is now selling out and looking like he's going to be a very successful entrepreneur in his own right. It's an engineering company uh, about 10, 12 miles out of Belfast. And yet, in terms of his complement of engineers, the one who's closest to Belfast is from Poland. The rest are from even further east 
uh, in Europe. So there is a terrible mismatch between skills uh, and, and education and what the labour market uh, is looking for. So we need to look at all these issues. I say there's 10 asks, I'll not, I'll not rehearse all of them. The other big economic one is to take Northern Ireland and turn it into an enterprise zone. Uh, and if you look internationally and things like rates relief and, and any incentives to reinvest, uh, there, are, there are actions, clear actions you can take. Whether they would work in the Northern Ireland context again depends on what Mrs May wants out of the negotiations. Because if we're in the single market uh, and we've got the four freedoms, uh, then that means certain things cannot be done because there'll be state aid. Uh, but if we're not in the European single market, if we're not in, in the customs union, then other things may be, may be possible. Working with, with the Dublin government, I think, is critical because if we only go for the one channel into London, uh, we're closing off uh, very valuable communications channels uh, and we're not maximising our friendship uh, with yourselves uh, here in the Irish Republic. So I'm, I suppose my final thought is I'm a little concerned that the two parties of the executive are going to drive this now and try and exclude uh, the parties uh, of opposition. And, and I don't think that's a good idea because this is more important than anything we have faced uh, since devolution was restored in 1998. And the parties of opposition have the same problem as the parties of the Northern Ireland Executive. Uh, one for, one against leaving uh, the European Union. Uh, and I think having the four heads thinking through these issues is probably better than just having uh, the two. But those, those are kind of my initial thoughts, uh, and I'm more than happy to listen to your questions and your comments. And thank you for listening.